If we get this obsessive over a teenage boy ever again, somebody's gonna report us to the police. But just being honest, Nebraska fans are desperate right now. It's not that the last coaching staff failed to bring in NFL level talent. It just felt like anything that could go wrong did and half the fan base is so scarred from the past 10 years that the one guy who's supposed to play in Lincoln can't end up with the title, the one who got away. Dylan Rayola is still at least three months away from committing to play for a championship contender with Kirby Smart in Georgia, a QB factory at USC with Lincoln Riley, or a rebuild in Nebraska with Matt Rule. But the way momentum shifted over the last couple months, it's hard to imagine Nebraska losing this recruiting battle a second time. One player is not enough to revive a broken program, but it'd be a damn good start. So today, I'm breaking down why I think Dylan Rayola ends up at Nebraska, what his commitment would mean for Matt Rule, and why on three dropped his recruiting ranking. But what's up guys, I'm Connor Hayden, and this is Corn Crazed. If you're a fan of Nebraska or the Big Ten, hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss any of my off-season breakdowns. And if you think there's a good chance Nebraska lands Dylan, hit the like button now to help us get to 1,000. But now, let's get into it. Yeah, across midfield. Touchdown, Nebraska! Omar Manning! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The other day, I saw that on three drop Dylan from the top overall player in their 2024 rankings all the way down to number six. And of course, some Nebraska fans felt like that was some sort of personal attack since there was so much positive momentum with his recruitment after he showed up to the basketball game on Saturday. But what's the real reason he dropped five spots and does it even matter? Well, in 2021, he played his sophomore season at Burleson in Texas, where he threw for over 3,300 yards and 32 touchdowns. But that team finished eight and four and they never beat any highly ranked teams. As a junior, he played at Chandler in Arizona, and they played five teams in the top 10 of the state rankings, but his production dropped a bit. He only threw for 2,400 yards this season, and he threw 10 less touchdowns. So even though he was on a better team and faced tougher competition, he didn't outplay some of the quarterbacks he faced. Chandler lost to Basha twice, and while Dylan was taking multiple sacks in both games, the 5'11 four-star QB at Basha was gashing the D with massive runs and 50-yard bombs to steal the show. I won't just assume that his performance this year is all that On3 takes into account when they re-rank this class, but I do think it was somewhat a factor. If you ask Matt Rule how much he cares about the rankings, I'm sure he's going to laugh because he takes some of the most underrated or ignored recruits in the entire country. Fans care a little since they want the highest rated class for bragging rights, but what's this ranking mean for Dylan? Well, if he goes to USC or Georgia, it doesn't mean anything since the entire roster is filled with guys like him. USC just took the fifth best QB in the class, and Georgia has Vandegrift, who was the fourth highest rated in 2021. The difference between those schools and Nebraska is the pressure. The fact that his dad's a football legend already casts a serious shadow on Dylan as a player, but add in the fact that he looks the part to be the next chosen one in Lincoln, and that pressure is as great as it could ever be. The fan base for the team that he grew up loving is so desperate and so thirsty for any glimpse of positivity that they'll go crazy just to see him take a visit. If he were to go to school at Nebraska, the top ranking means the expectations would be so high that anything short of nine wins a year or record-breaking seasons as a passer would be looked at as failure. And if he was at SC or Georgia and he didn't live up to the hype, he could just quietly hit the portal and never feel like he let anybody down except for himself. But here's the good news. Dudes like Dylan want that pressure. They thrive knowing the odds are against them and their teammates, but that they have the ability to make history and completely rewrite the script. So even though the ranking doesn't mean anything for his recruitment or his future as a player, it does mean a lot in terms of perception and expectations, especially at a school like Nebraska. I was talking to my cousin who works at Rivals just to get his thoughts on all of this, and he basically said this past month with all the hype and excitement reminds him of the big time recruits in the past. Nebraska fans went all out for Micah Parsons and Bookie Radley Hiles, only to be let down after they chose OU and Penn State. 
Then we saw Tajon Lindsay and Wandale Robinson make it onto the field, but both ended up finishing their careers at other programs. It's screwed up because we as fans are getting conditioned to believe that the letdown's inevitable. So even if Rayola did make it to campus, we'd have this lingering paranoia that the offense ends up being a shit show, Satterfield gets fired to buy Rule more time, Dylan transfers out, and we're back to the same cycle since that's the Nebraska football we've gotten used to. But that's not fair. It's not fair to the players. It's not fair to these coaches. It's not fair to you as a fan. And it's not fair to Nebraska. If Kansas can fix their issues and have nice things, so can we. Dylan's got a ton of offers. I think it's 30 or something crazy. But let's talk about the four realistic teams on the radar. And we'll start off with Georgia since they seem to be the biggest threat at this point. If I'm a five-star QB with no family ties to any school and my goal is to win a Heisman, a national championship, and get to the NFL, rolling with Kirby's the obvious choice. They did lose their OC Todd Munkin to the Ravens, but Rayola already knew that was coming and he's developed a strong relationship with the new OC, Mike Bobo. Mike Bobo was Matt Stafford's QB coach who turned him into a number one pick and Stafford played with Dylan's dad in Detroit for six years. So Stafford being a former dog and helping Dylan as a quarterback his entire life is pretty hard to overlook. He's a perfect fit in their system, he's got great relationships with their staff, and as of today, they're the team to beat. Next is USC, whose main draw is Lincoln Riley. And the pros list is obvious, so let's talk about the cons. Number one, USC just signed Malachi Nelson, who was the fifth rated QB in the class and gets an entire year to learn the playbook and study under Caleb Williams before Dylan can even get on campus. And number two, Lincoln Riley hasn't had major success with a pro style quarterback. Dylan can move in the pocket, but he's not dual threat. Baker, Kyler, Jalen, and Caleb all averaged over 100 carries a year, and the one guy who didn't was Spencer Rattler, who lost his job to Caleb. I'm not saying Lincoln wouldn't find a way to make it work, but if he's already got Malachi Nelson who can work outside the pocket the way his other QBs have, why settle for a single threat? Oregon's the other school who's making a push and Dylan's planning on taking a visit there, but just being real, the Georgia relationships and upside and the Nebraska connection feel way too strong at this point for me to think there's any real shot there. And that leads us to Nebraska and why I think he'll end up playing for Matt Rule. The first time I felt confident that this staff could seal the deal was about a month ago after Dominic did a podcast with Callahan and Sipple. He emphasized the importance of his son being around good people, a selfless culture, and a place where players would be developed as people and not just athletes. And even though he didn't hint that Nebraska was the front runner or the perfect fit, he talked about the brand and this staff in such a positive light that it was hard for me to get over the fact that Dylan grew up in the same environment that I did. Since birth, he's known about the tradition, the legendary players and coaches who left their mark on college football, and how much more this team means to their state than any other program in the country. And even after years of mediocrity, Dom still called Nebraska a sleeping giant and talked about how important it is that this team gets the respect they deserve because of the brand that's been built over the past 50 years. Another topic that's actually proven to be more of a positive than I initially thought is Donovan Rayola's title as O-line coach. In that same interview, Dom mentioned that Donovan being retained was 100% about his coaching ability and not a play for Dylan, but because the staff saw the potential in his brother, that it showed the entire Rayola family what Matt Rule's all about. The family has a trusted inside source feeding Dylan real information about what's going on behind the scenes without the recruiting pitch bias, but even more important is the fact that Dylan's got more opportunities to talk to a Nebraska coach and be around the program than he can with any other school in America. Just the other day, he went to a Nebraska basketball game as a fan, even though he couldn't visit with the football staff, and the entire stadium went crazy for him, chanting his name, asking for pictures, and showing him how important he is to the entire state. I'm not saying other schools won't value him or love him as much as Nebraska would, but here's the truth. I've read hundreds of comments from Georgia fans on message boards and social media, and you know how they feel about this recruitment? Sure, we'd like to have Dylan, but to be honest, we've got plenty of five-star QBs and more are coming to take that job. So for the good of college football, we'd love to see Dylan go to Nebraska to help him get back to being relevant. Those are Georgia fans' words, not mine. 
The fact is, he's just another cog in their solid gold wheel, and although they'd love to have him, he's not their only hope, and the same goes for USC. At Nebraska, he's king. The boosters would match any NIL offer he gets from another program, and the staff would adjust the offense to suit his strengths since he'd likely be the most gifted player on the field. And before you say I'm exaggerating the potential impact he'd have in Lincoln, first answer this. When was the last time Nebraska competed for a championship, and how much of an impact did their quarterback make that year? Back on January 27th, Marcus Satterfield went to Arizona to see Dylan, and just three days later, the announcement came out that he decided to transfer from Chandler to Pinnacle. And Pinnacle's the same school that Spencer Rattler played at, and as you know, Satterfield was his OC last year at South Carolina. I don't want to speculate that the Nebraska coach influenced the family's decision to transfer schools, but the timing was interesting, and if for some reason he did have some advice for the Rayolas about which high school he should play at, that shows there's some serious trust in Matt Rule's OC. As important as it is for Dylan to play for a coach who can win, based on what we know from interviews, it's just as big a deal for him to play for a staff who values family and faith as much as he does. And I didn't know this until today, but back when Dylan first committed to Ohio State, he did it at his church. And I'm sure other coaches recruiting him have a relationship with God, but from what we've seen so far, Matt Rules is close to a prophet that you'll find in a football coach. And these might seem like little details, but at this point in the game, that's what Rayola is examining. On March 25th, Nebraska hosts three legacies in Caleb Benning, Mario Buford, and Dylan. And they're going to host the number one player in the state in Carter Nelson and the number one D-tackle in the nation in Williams Winery. We know Dylan's reached out to other top-tier talent to see who else is interested in the new staff, and I think the last confirmation he's looking for is that other NFL-level talent would be willing to come play with him in Lincoln. As awesome as it is to be a hero for an entire state and play in front of the best fans, if you're the best QB in the nation, you need assurance that the team around you can pull their own weight. So two of the most important dates coming up are March 25th with eight of the top 350 on three prospects, and then the spring game, April 22nd, when I'm sure a ton of recruits will be in attendance and the new staff can show how far they've come in their first five months on campus. I said earlier that signing one five-star isn't going to flip the entire program, but I promise you, it's going to get the ball rolling. Nebraska hasn't had elite quarterback play in a long time, and most championship programs are led by guys who I'd put in that category. Landing Dylan would turn an already insane fan base into full-on psychos, and the standard Matt Rule would be setting in just his first year would be higher than we've seen in a very long time. One player doesn't guarantee wins, but it's a sure sign that Nebraska can be everything we believe it should be. But I want to know what you think, so let me know in the comments below. Do you care that On3 dropped his ranking, or would you still gladly accept the sixth best player in the class? Do you think George is the front runner, or is USC just as dangerous at this point? And after it's all said and done, where do you think Rayola takes his first snap as a college quarterback? I'm going to say there's a 70% chance it's Nebraska in my book, but we're just going to have to wait and see. So until next time, thank you for being here, and I'll see you in the next one. Go Big Red.